Hey, hey, welcome to the crossover at the Final Four. This is Joe R. Lucas coming to you from Langsys Arena in Cologne, Germany. And I'm here with some very distinguished guests, as we can see. And I don't know what it looks like in your screen, but on my screen to my left is the man, one of the guys that I followed. I, mean, I can remember following him my whole life. When I was a kid, he was young. We were playing in college more or less together, but he just played at a real college. I played at a normal college. Mr. David Rivers, you came over here and dominated Europe, and you're still here living in Italy, my man. <laughs> yeah, good to be with you. Good to good be with you, Joe, everyone. Thank Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, down to my lower left is Mr. Turkey, is what I call him, man. Every time every time I look at this guy's stats, every time I go through Wikipedia, every time I see anything, it's, he played, I think, he, Sinan, you played in every team in Turkey for like, what, 30 years or something? My, uh, you've been on every team at least three times. Um, 15 years for sure. And I've been, uh, I played in every team in Istanbul, that's for sure. <laughs> that's that. Every team in Istanbul, without a doubt. Yes. Like, how many total teams were there, if, if you count them all? Um, there's probably more than, you know, 10, 15, but they're all smaller clubs. But in the professional level, I think in the first division, we had total six teams, seven teams in Istanbul. Wow. And now to my right, I'm not sure where he's coming for you guys, is, and I, and I see – I see the shirt. I see the Maccabi Tel Aviv sign there. Are you still in Tel Aviv, coach? Yes, yes, of course. We have to participate in the playoffs starting on still, Monday. Still playing in the playoffs. Where, are you right at the beginning of, this, of the playoff season? We will start on Monday. We play the day before yesterday the cup final. We won the cup here, the Israeli cup. Mm -hmm. uh, and now today we start our preparation for uh, the playoffs. Coach Yanis Svaropoulos, que is a, a, I mean, you've already been under crossover, so you know what this is all about. But this is a little bit different format because we're going to talk about this Final Four. And, and, man, I know there's no fans. I know we've been through Corona. I know, Coach, you, you've struggled throughout the year to keep your team healthy, to, to go through all the protocols that had to be so difficult throughout the season. But the two games that we saw yesterday, <laughs> I mean – it, it, it's like you almost didn't miss fans. You, you you know how much it would have meant to have the fans in the stands to watch those two incredible games. But it's almost like when you were there, you didn't miss them. But I want to start with the with the Milan Barcelona game. Uh, wh what did you guys think? It, it, it was like to me, it was it was like a boxing match, man. David, it, it was like old school, like you score, I score, you score, I score. And, and you, everybody talked about defense, you know, Barcelona's defense. It was a low-scoring game. And both teams were going off in the first half. Yeah, yeah I uh, actually had Milano winning this game. I did. Uh, I thought the same thing. Yeah, uh, but, but at the end of the day, I think um, Barcelona pulled it out because they stayed true to themselves. Um, they, they were more consistent. Uh, from my viewpoint, but, um, you know, great game. And I had the thought, you know, the place would be going crazy if fans were, were at that game, uh, both games, actually. So it was, it was good, you know, good viewing. Co Coach, there was, there was a, a moment, and I, I talked to Cyrus about this after the game when I questioned them. There was a moment when they were down like nine or ten I, I remember it being 67 to 60. And he had none of his stars in the game. Miritic was on the bench. Uh, Higgins, Higgins, of course, was on the bench with four fouls. Gasol wasn't out there. And he went with a team that looked like almost like a team of – I mean, they're, they're good players. Claver, Smith, these are good players, but they're, they're role players now. And he, what, do you think that was a strategy that he came out with to look at? I'm going to take my stars out and let these guys grind it out. But it's, you're down seven. That's a yes. gutsy move. It's a, put... tough, it's a tough decision, of course. But uh, Saras knows better his players. And uh, I think that he knew that uh, with his role players, he can uh, uh, turn the game around uh, through his defense. I think he changed his defense. Uh, they, play, they start to play switching defense. He wanted big, big uh, bodies and uh, hustling uh, plays on defense. That's why he used this type of uh, lineups uh, that uh, would support his strategy plan. And I think this is how he, they came back to the game. Uh, 
this is how slowly, slowly they cut down the difference, mainly from their defense. And uh, then when they they came together, uh, for sure he put the the play the players that uh, he was thinking in, that in that moment they should uh, produce better on offense. You know, all, all three of you guys and myself, we all know that that our our philosophy is you're only as good as your last game. You know, because there's always the next game coming up. And I was sitting there thinking as I'm watching the game, I'm like, man, if this backfires on it and they go down, instead of coming back into that game, they go down 15 with that lineup in. I could just imagine what the press was going to be talking about. Is you know, first Final Four, big team. You know, you guys, you coaches have it difficult, man, because it's one good decision, you're great. And one bad decision, you're, you're nothing. You are absolutely right. Uh, you know, coaches are uh, judged from their decisions. I think uh, sometimes uh, in the game you need to take a tough decision to change the, your plan and your strategy, to have a plan B, first of all, and to follow this plan B. Um, but to me, the most important is that uh, this showed that uh, Saras is, uh, uh, is believing in all of his players. doesn't matter if they are uh, big names or if they are not great names, but uh, uh, I can, we cannot say that Barcelona doesn't have big names, but... I mean, you know what I mean. Um, some guys that are the go-to guys in Barcelona, some, some they are part of the system. So I think uh, his decision was tough, but uh, for sure he knew that the, his players better than all, the, all of us, that we are outside of the team. He counted on them and they, he trusted them and they saw him back this, uh, uh, this confidence that uh, he had on them. Senan, the... It, it was Higgins steps out of the game. Higgins was having, he was having an okay game. He wasn't having a mm -hmm. game that you expect from him. But he was pretty smooth in the beginning. He, he, he got a, away from his game a little bit, got four fouls, was on the bench. As, a, as an ex-player, man, and I asked him this also yesterday, I'm like, man, what's it feel like when you're watching the lead slip away? You're on the bench with that fourth foul. You can't get back out on the floor. And, and you know, you know, like Coach is saying, you, you trust your coach and make the right decision, but yet you're sitting there going, man, put me back in, man. Come on, just get me. I'm not going to make the fifth foul. What do you think is going through his mind at that, that point in the game? Well, for sure, first of all, the seat's probably on fire at that point. He wants to get off the seat and get into the play. <laughs> and second, not only he can like the, the connection between the coach and the players, um, it all depends on the energy of the game. You know, both David and coach said perfect things the consistency and the momentum was shifting away from Barcelona. And with the lineup that they played with, Barcelona start gaining the momentum and Milan tried to finish the game off quick. I think that was the thing that kind of turned the game around where they wanted to finish the game off. And as David said, they kept on, Barcelona kept on to their game plan. And for Corey, uh, the best part is just be there at the right moment. First of all, I think it's a big rebound that he took and make sure that he, he got the right play in. Uh, but as I said, you know, when, when you're agitated in a sense with the four fouls, you don't want to go out and gamble, but at the same time, you want to make sure that the team wins at that point, probably he's at the same time trusting his teammates on the court to put the right energy, to bring the momentum back to the team. But you know, one of the, one of the things I thought of, this is either one of the three of you is, if Kalatas doesn't go down and get hurt, is is that ball in Higgins' hands at the end of the game, or is it in Kalatas' hands? Because you're not you're not trusting Nick to make that three as much as you are Higgins. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest there. A any it's for any one of you three. That that ball was in the point guard's hand. <laughs> it would it would have been right. No 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 question because you're talking about one of the most unselfish players um, to, to play the game at, at, at this level who can, can score when he needs to score. But that ball being in Kalati's hands basically makes everyone, all the other four players, a threat for that shot because he's going he's gonna to look for the best shot. I don't want to get away from – I mean, we're going to talk about that last shot in a second. I don't, and I don't want to get away from Coach Messina because Coach Messina did an incredible job. He was he was pissed, to say the least, at halftime. 
he was not happy with his team. He gave up, not only did they give up 51 points, and I asked him, I said, Coach, I said, you gave up 51 points. I said, with, a, with a 30 seconds left in the second quarter, your team only had two, two team fouls. I said, and, and, you know, so he changed the attitude of his team. He made them come out more aggressive. But in the, in the end, even though it wasn't a defensive game, it was Barcelona's defense that just clamped down within those two or three minutes that changed everything. But Coach Messina, I mean, he brought his team back into the game. I think the crucial part, uh, the crucial moment was uh, the beginning of the second half for uh, Armani. And being down with uh, nine points, uh, they should uh, change the way of playing because uh, allowing 51 points in the first half is not the style of Armani. Right. And this is what exactly happened. Coach Messina turned around with uh, convincing the players that uh, they should play more aggressive on defense and put their bodies. This is what we, we've seen in the beginning. Uh, everybody was committed, more aggressive, uh, tough, with hands on the ball. And uh, they start to come back uh, after good defenses and um, transition plays that uh, uh, they had some easy baskets uh, on transition. And this uh, uh, helped also some of the players, main players, to, to get hot, like Panther, that Oof, in, the in the beginning of the second half was very crucial. And all the second half was amazing playing against uh, the tough defense of uh, Barcelona. There was a moment tactically that uh, when uh, Barcelona was switching the pick and rolls, Armani turned to shooting actions and not on pick and roll actions. And this is how they continue with uh, Panther uh, hitting from the curls out of coming out of the screens. And uh, Panther made also one very important three point shot when it was 82 79, one and a half minutes before the end, tying the game. And from that moment, you know, the most. Uh, uh, lucky, I can say also, not only capable, but also lucky uh, would have won the game because we saw Panther having uh, uh, another open uh, three shot before yeah. the shot of Higgins. But as you said, uh, Higgins has the personality, is the player that uh, stepped up, uh, took the most important shot of the game and made the game to bring uh, Barcelona to the final, to the final of, the, of the championship. Give me, give me, give me your three, three opinions. It was, it was obviously the only shot he could take pretty much at that time. But was it lucky? No, no. I don't think it was luck. You don't think it was luck? <laughs> no, no, no. no the, the body, the body language would uh, lead me to believe that uh, he was very confident. <laughs> Yes, I, I love him, man. He's so smooth. And, and, and Corey has this left pull-up. You know, yeah. he's very good uh, on every left pull-up that he, you, the defense gives him. Most, most of us right-handed shooters are better going to our left anyway. Yeah, but, exactly. But what, what about Punter, man? He, I mean, wasn't he fun to watch tonight? You, you played back in the day. You know, you, you're not as old as me, but David, you, we don't we, we love to watch people just take over games. I mean, that's like old school basketball. Absolutely. I, I think he was a little frustrated uh, at different times because he was in a rhythm. And I, I don't think the ball found his way to him maybe as, as much as, as he would have liked. But, um, you know, it was great. It was great watching him play. And like I said, I had them to win it because of their talent, overall talent, and the experience. Right. Uh, but it was a great, great game uh, to watch on TV. It would have been even better if fans would have been able to see it live in person. For sure. No doubt. Let's, let, let's move on. I to want this. to add, uh, Joe, Go I ahead. want to add that uh, for, for Barcelona team, we saw again uh, the good days of Mirotic. And yes. I think it was very crucial for them because, uh, as you remember, uh, Mirotic had uh, around... Uh, 17 points average in the regular season, but uh, dropped down to close to nine points, eight points, eight point six points average uh, in the playoffs. Uh, during the playoff games, he was not so effective for his team, but uh, we saw him in this crucial moment for his team stepping out and uh, getting a lot of uh, personal uh, uh, responsibility for the team. Uh, he was also important at the end uh, when uh, it was the game was hot 
and uh, Barcelona post him a lot to to try to yeah. score from the post or to get to the line from the post. And this is exactly what he did. And uh, from the other side, as you said before, uh, the absence of Kalathis at the end. Uh, uh, I don't know, Kalathis was also in a good day and uh, he scored a lot. He had also from outside shooting yesterday good percentages, 40%. Uh, he had six assists. He started the game really well with uh, four points and five, five assists in the first period. And in general, always Kalathis, as David said, uh, makes his teammates uh, better. So I don't know if this will affect uh, uh, Barcelona to the final game. Senat, the, the, as coach is saying, the big topic here this week, during the week before the game, was was. Misic getting the MVP over Mirotic. And, and a lot of people have talked about the fact that because you include the playoffs, it's not a regular season MVP award. If it was a regular season MVP award, it would have probably been, been Mirotic. But since they include the playoffs, as Coach just explained to us, his average dropped. He didn't play that well in the playoffs. And, and he's had a little bit. I'm, I'm trying not – I'm trying to – like tread lightly right now, but he's had a little bit of a reputation of not showing up in big games. Yeah. Do, do you think that it was that that was yesterday was his day? Was it had anything to do with it, the, him not winning the MVP, or is he just like I'm so sick of hearing people tell me I don't show up for big games that I'm just going to go out from the first minute and play hard? Well, I think that it's a combination of both and everything because you know he everybody's talking about how much of an impact that he's going to make in the EuroLeague basketball after coming from the NBA. And there are a lot of expectations from Barcelona. There's a lot of expectation from basketball fans. So it's a combination of both things uh, and some more when you come to this point. And for me, you know, even though like I, I've, I had the chance to experience two Final Fours and both of them, one of them I was out on the, uh, on the bleachers and the other one I was on the bench with the team. But still, it's like, it's a time to enjoy. It's time to show what you're capable of, no matter what the score is. And we saw a lot of this in the main players as a sense in both games. And I think right. Mirotic had a, had a great game. And he's, he's basically the locomotive of the team with, you know, adding Kalates as the leader of the team and sh sharing and making everybody better. So I think he's doing what he's supposed to do. And there's always some kind of burden on his shoulders and expectations coming. Let's I'd like to add on, ahead, to, uh, Joe. Uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, you know, Miritich, when you talk about his points dropping off, um, okay, that's one thing. But you don't see him uh, going off the deep end and, and becoming completely and totally ineffective. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you have to give him credit in that he's sticking with it. And as Coach pointed out, he had some some very key moments where they went to him and he was able to deliver, even though he didn't get the 17 or the 20 points. And and that's something that um, that I took note of. But he has to play better on Sunday to win. Yeah, they, he had a, he had a huge play. I don't know if you remember. I think it was it was punter or. Or I can't remember the day. Maybe went up for a rebound. It looked like he jumped a little bit too early. The ball hung up there a little bit high, and he picked up that offensive rebound. And and that's that's just part of being aggressive because you're there at the play. Because that's an easy play to give up on, you know, and start running back on defense. But you know, he 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 had that that attack mode to the whole night. I thought that was that was a big thing for him. Let's time wise. Let's let's get to the next game. I got to go down to my bottom left here since it, I'm talking missed. Mr. Istanbul down here. I, I got to, I, I want to get right to the punch. I, I, I don't want to waste any time with it. As I think it's the thing that we're going to talk about the most. How does Ephes continue to blow 20 point leads on a constant, and I'm, I'm saying a constant basis. We're talking about the, the, the last three games of the Real Madrid playoff. And they beat Madrid by 26, two games before the last round of the season. They beat Madrid by 20 the first game at home. They beat Madrid by 23 the second game at home. Never even – Madrid never had to leave. All of a sudden, this team who is averaging 90-something points a game from January 1st, the calendar year 2021, was being shut down. 
and we saw the same tendency tonight. Sinan, what, explain it to me because I can't. I, I I have my philosophy. I have my thought process, but I want to hear from you guys. Well, um, I was telling that to my wife with four and a half minutes left in Real Madrid game game three in Madrid that uh, Rudy hit a three point from the corner. And I just said, they might lose the series from this shot. And it appeared that way because the rest of the series happened to be a battle against how to react to what Madrid is showing to them. Um, we cannot oversee the talent that FS has as far as offensive talent goes. And we know each and I, I know each what each and every player's role is. But there comes a point where it's a 20-point lead. They're getting more relaxed. The main players, especially Misic and Larkin, they're, they're lowering their gear while Cheska comes out with a shorter lineup and start attacking them, beat him about. Uh, Real Madrid comes out with an extended version of a matchup zone where they cannot find a tempo. And with every miss, the opponent gets an easier bucket. Cheska did it yesterday, showed it many times. And I think that then with losing that rhythm, then they cannot find the solution that they wanted to do. And we know that FS plays even better when the other players are involved in scoring. That gives a lot of opportunities for Misic and Larkin to operate. I think that's what, that's what happens every um, mid-third quarter. They just stop playing somehow and they need to figure out that. And I think Simon said it the best, you know, at one point they were just looking at the clock and they were watching it wind down and they managed to survive that one. You know, it, it, I, I'm going to try to make a funny analogy here, but in, in those, those moments of the game, they look like a little kid that's not getting their toy. They're a little kid, a little kid that doesn't get their, their, you know, their piece of candy that they want, you know, and they mm. get so frustrated. They get they're like, they can't figure out what's going on and why why the game is not coming to them the same way. And coach, I want to go over to you right now because because Madrid did come out with an obvious they they, they went one two two full court, they went one two two half court and then they went to like a one two two which which you know Pablo Lasso's been doing for years. He used to do it yes. with Marcus Slaughter all the time yeah, when yeah. Marcus was that point. And he hasn't done it over the years and he did it there. And and other teams, in, in, in game four and five, he didn't do it as much. Or in game five, he didn't do it as much. But what happened at the end of the game was the ball gets into Mises' hand. The ball gets into Larkin's hand at the end of the game. And what happens is they see the isolation. And, and I've watched the last night with Mosca. It was like the two guys that were playing the wing, the wing players, you know, when the ball doesn't move, it's so much easier to play help defense. Yes, and, yes. And, and – it automatically develops into a, a, a pseudo one-two-two zone defense, and yeah. you saw Hackett get the steal. You saw you saw I, I can't remember who else got the steal, and and they were like you said, sit on. They were, they were turning the ball over, and Chesco was getting easier baskets. How how does Coach Adamant break this 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 isolation game at the end and, and, and continue to flow offensively like they do in the first half? You know, um, we are talking about uh, Madrid's 1-2-2 uh, two, two zone and it's similar with the switching defense what we've seen a lot of uh, times uh, in uh, these two games but also in general in, uh, lately in, in EuroLeague that a lot of teams they try to break the, um, the production and the organization of the opponent's offense using the switching defense that uh, blocks the drive and kick game a lot, blocks a lot the... After the heads out or the flat defense, they pass an extra pass and the movement of the ball. They want exactly what you said to isolate the plays, to keep the ball in one player's hands and all the defense to be focused uh, uh, while the ball is not moving, how to defend uh, one player. And this is exactly what is happening lately. Uh, from my point, uh, uh, the offensive team needs to find ways to move the ball uh, first of all, with the inside game, trying to find the inside mismatch and from inside to attack. And if they trap the inside mismatch, then to play the inside out game. And with this way, you move the defense and you move the ball. And this is how you need to execute uh, uh, from, from inside out. 
but also let's say some there are some tricks that you can do when the one player has the ball to for the outside mismatch that you can have some flare screens or some movement away from the ball that will give the chance to the player with the ball to find the the open looks so i think uh, all the teams now will work better on these situations i think these are special situations because the game uh, the flow of the game moves now to the isolations so we need to find ways as coaches and players together with the players how we will find the best option and uh, for for the player that will be open to shoot the ball i think the way is uh, to use some um, off ball movement while the player is attacking the outside in his match and of course to attack from the inside in his match i think david it's it's, it's so important i think what coach was just saying is, is a way to do it, but you have to find a way, especially efforts that all four or five guys that are on the floor touch the ball on every possession. Cause that's when they become so dangerous because what they're doing when everybody touches the ball, they're moving the defense and the defense isn't stagnant anymore. It's not sitting there waiting for a penetration. And that's, you know, I've seen me come off of pick so often come off of, or Larkin come off a of pick and penetrate through the middle. And that's, what's getting shut down. How, how do they get all five guys to touch that ball when they're so stagnant? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, they got stagnant uh, yesterday because, uh, as Sinam said, Coach uh, alluded to, they, they started watching the clock. Uh, they started watching the clock, and they took their foot off the gas. And whenever you do that, it's hard to regain the momentum that you established from the outset of the game. Uh, they got they got very lucky yesterday, FS. Uh, they got very lucky, and and I think because of what they experienced yesterday, they're probably going to play a lot better on Sunday. But at the end of the day, I, I I'm glad to hear Coach talk about starting the game from the inside out because that's something that I was <laughs> I was taught since I was able to identify a ball. And, and, you're, a, a and you're a point leader. guard. You're I'm, a point guard. I'm, I'm, I'm believe in that because at the end of the day, you start that game from the inside out. Number one, you're getting that ball close to the rim. And with guys that can move like FS have, they, you know, over the course of the game, they're going to find opportunities. They're going to find their touches. So I, I think it's critical to get that inside game established. Um, but but the, the biggest takeaway that I had yesterday and watching that FS Jessica game was the fact that FS came out and really put their fingerprint on the defense. I I thought I thought that was that was setting the tone right then and there. And then the offense flowed. But when they got up 20, 20 plus points, um, they they all just kind of sat back and was just watching the clock. But I Meanwhile, was, Jessica, it, it, uh, Jessica, I think if the more desperate their situation got, the more aggressive they got. Mm. Imagine if Jessica had started the game the way that they had started playing in mid third and fourth quarter. It probably would have been a different outcome. Uh, David, you, you opened up my eyes to something that I forgot about because that's what I was most impressed with. Sanan, I'll go to you in this, was, was FS's defense in the beginning of the game. They, they just they stifled Jessica's um, offense they, were, they, they couldn't get an open look at the basket that there, there was a couple turnovers there weren't those bad turnovers that, that led to like easy fast break points but there were turnovers that were devastated to them it was so frustrating but it was the it was the the turkish defense that was actually winning that game like david said it helped you know defense turns into offense we all know that most of us that, that play most people like to say that offense make i used to say offense made me a better defensive player but that was just a lie that was that's something to say, but we all know that defense turns into offense. And that's what happened with FS yesterday. Yes, um, for sure. And I think, you know, both both sides of the game feeds each other. Um, when you when you see how FS started off the game, they start finding the solutions with the mismatches looking inside mostly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they hit, uh, they hit five or six three points in the first quarter. And that gave them energy to play more aggressive defense. And they want to of course, get excited and get, they want to blow the game out. But at the end, um, they start getting stops. Uh, they start missing shots and that affected their defense because it's easy bucket coming to the other way. They turn the ball over. And 
I think, you know, FS actually, when, when they find the right lineups, they figure out how to close the three point line and make that defense as tough as possible, but that they feed off from offense a lot to play that defense also. I'm looking at this screen. I see four like basketball purists, you know, where, you know, coach, coach has to be a little bit more new school because he has no other choice, but you know, the rest of us are a little bit old school, even though coach has still got the old school left in him. Now I know, I know you got, I know you got Shane Larkin. I know you got me since I know you got everybody, but the new, can we all, is everybody else have a band crush? Like I do on Colonel's La Simone. He, he's my favorite player. I mean, he's the piece that makes that team work. I, I, I love this guy. Simon is very experienced and uh, he knows how to, from one side to, to score, from the other side to create for his teammates. And uh, this makes him really dangerous for every defense because uh, you don't know how to stop him. He can shoot from outside, he can uh, penetrate with his left. We saw him making yesterday an amazing left hook shot, very difficult, <laughs> going away from the rim. And, you know, he can, in general, I think that uh, he's a big, uh, he deserves big credit for the good offensive game of FS. Uh, we, we cannot uh, say that Misic or uh, Larkin uh, or all the other players that uh, FS has, they are not talented. But I think Simon is also very experienced and he knows the European basketball really well and he knows exactly what he has to do at every moment. Yeah, you, but you could have, a, you could have, go ahead, David, in a second. You, you could have Larkin, who's been having a couple bad games every now and then, or Mises that might have a bad game like he did, I think, game one in the playoffs against Madrid. But, but it's just, it seems like that Simon is just, He's just constantly rock solid. He's that guy as a coach. You could say every time I go out, I don't even have to talk to him before the game. I know he's got this. Yes, exactly. And uh, except all these players that we mentioned, Simon and all the others, I want to say also about Bobois that yesterday started oh. the game really well. And so you, you can understand that FS has a lot of players that they can, they can push the team. And uh, this is the most uh, difficult for uh, the opponents for Barcelona, let's say, talking about the final game, that uh, you never know who each player will step up and uh, which player will be in a, a good day that you need to stop. Everybody is so dangerous, and this is why FS is uh, so effective uh, uh, offensively and defensively. I think because we talk about their, their defense, uh, FS is also a great defending team. But I want to say that when FS is good offensively, they play good defense. Yeah. They have some defensive players, defensive-minded players that they use a lot to build uh, their defense on them and through them. But uh, you can see that when something doesn't go well offensively, this makes uh, their defense uh, weakest. And uh, the, for FS, it's very crucial and important, uh, the flow of their offense because the, this uh, gives uh, in a positive uh, momentum offensively, they, they, they play excellent defense also. So uh, this is something that uh, they should uh, keep uh, working. And I think that that's the reason because uh, what, that's the reason uh, why uh, they give up so many, so big difference yesterday and the other games we saw with Madrid that uh, somehow in one moment of the game, they lose their concentration, mainly offensively. And this, because they don't perform good on offense, gives extra and easy points on transition to the opponents, and then start the, the, the stress and the anxious how to, uh, uh, to finish the game as fast as, as uh, possible. I don't want, David, I want to go to you now. I don't want to finish this conversation about this game. And we're going to move on to the next game right now, the final. But I, I, I got to talk about Coach Dudis because he did an amazing job yesterday. He did it two years ago in Basconia against Madrid when his team was down like 15 or so or 14. He went to a smaller lineup. He did the same thing again yesterday. And I want to talk about him, and I want to talk obviously about a, a guy who was two years ago MVP, Will Clyburn, had an amazing game and just broke down Ephesus' defense yesterday single-handed. Yeah, listen, uh, you know, Coach uh, speaks for himself and what he's been able to accomplish 
wherever he has been been the head coach. Um, the the thing that um, that is always going to get my attention is is consistency and what you do in those critical moments. Uh, you know, Claiborne is is a is a very good player. I actually thought um, you know he missed some opportunities uh, to to score and to to further put pressure on on FS. But um, he had a good game, and, and all things being said, he had a good game. But that last shot, um, you know, <laughs> that's, that's my that's my next question. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta put that pressure on the defense. That last shot, he should. You know, I was hoping he would take it to the hole. But put that's that pressure what, that, on the defense. But, put that pressure on the officials. That's what he does. That's, you know, that's, he scored that basket. He he's either he's either going to the line, you know, shooting two, or going to the line for an one. But either way, he's getting a higher percent of chance of taking that game into overtime. And I think in overtime, it's it's a maybe a different outcome. Everybody, does everybody else agree with that shot, Coach Zanon? You agree with it was not the best shot selection at that point of the game. I know every player wants to win the game, but. As soon as Larkin missed that one free throw, and you know it was going to be at a, 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 a most a two-point game, you have to be thinking attack the hoop, right? Am I right or wrong about that? Or if David and I, were, at least we're on the same team right now. No, for sure. I think that, you know, at the timeout, I was thinking about what what um, FS should do is not help from Voitman because he's the biggest threat to make that shot right. uh, outside of the three-point line. And we were all expecting an attack to the basket with him being 100% field goal percentage from the inside. So I think Singleton having four fouls, he doesn't want to give an M1 or three-point uh, foul attempt. He just backed off a little bit too much, which gave him the, let's say, a courage to think about yeah. shoot, making that shot. Tough call, man, because if he makes it, he's a hero. <laughs> I think... Um... At the end of the day, it's the personality of the players to decide which way they will go. For sure, when you need a two-point shot, it's better to go inside, as you said, to maybe to get a foul, maybe to go to the line, maybe to, you know, to play the game. You know, how you... Because we saw that Clyburn uh, at, was attacking one-on-one -on -one and nobody could stop him. And this is what we expected uh, for, from him to, to, to do at the, at the end of the game. He, take, he took the decision to, to take this shot from outside. For sure, he's counting on his shot. He missed it. As you said, it's the, I, I say that uh, whatever coaches are planning, at the end of the day, this, this type of games that they judged by the last shot is the personality of the players. And uh, the players know really well uh, how to attack in that moment. I agree that uh, Sigleton step back and uh, uh, give him half step to shoot. And this is what he took that moment. Yeah, I, I, there, there might be another show somewhere that's called the crossover with somebody else that's talking about the fact that he took the perfect shot. I don't know. You know, we're, Like I said, we're a little bit of old school. We want to go to the basket. But nowadays, it seems like that final shot is always the same. It's always that like step back three-pointer to try to win a game. It's become yes. like, I don't exactly. know. Exactly. For me, uh, it's very interesting for EuroLeague that uh, we had uh, both games finishing uh, after a uh, last shot. And uh, this, is, this happened the uh, first time, I think, in the history of EuroLeague. Both semifinals to finish uh, only with, uh, after uh, the last shot. So this is very interesting for the fans to watch. And unfortunately, as you mentioned uh, in the beginning of our conversation, we don't have fans, uh, the, fan pr the fans' presence in the, on the court. Uh, right now is where we're going to listen to the interviews I did this morning. I did an interview with Alex Abrinas, and I did an interview with my man, Curtis Love Simone. It was like, it was like, it was like I, was, I, I was so happy. But as he sat down in front of me, my little man crush is like, hey, that's my man, Simone. <laughs> but we're going to go listen to these interviews before we uh, move on to the last game. Well, we reached one of the goals of the of the season uh, with this team. Uh, we wanted to play all the finals, and... And since now we play it all, we did it in the Kings Cup in, in Spain, and now we have the chance to to win this trophy. So we're very proud and excited about about all the the job we've done during all those months, and and now it's it's the time, it's the final game. 
well, I think after the third, uh, we just lock in on defense, especially, and and it was now we were not giving up easy easy points. So uh, we practice all year for those moments. Uh, we also have games uh, against Zenith, for example, that we have some up and downs, and, and we learn from it. So I think what happened yesterday is is more or less what happened to us in in Zenith. Uh, we were down eight after a back quarter, but like it, all the, the five players lock in and. And just help each other out, and and well, we kept uh, Milano in eleven points, I think, the last quarter. So play defense, obviously, as you said, this is going to be hard because uh, they play with high freedom. Uh, they have players uh, with so many points in their hands, and and we're going to play much better than than we did yesterday to to win this final. Uh, obviously, as you said, uh, they can easily score a hundred points. We also can score a hundred points, but I think the the team who plays better defense in Keeps the opponent below, let's say, 70 or 80 points. Uh, it's going to take the game. Uh, yes, of course. Let's start with 2019. You know, it was, a, it was a big surprise for everybody that we even show up in this Final Four because people people didn't count on us, you know. Year, year, year before that Final Four, we were at the last spot of the, of the league. So, played, yeah. so it was unexpected that we will come all the way to the final but but I think we show in these three years that this team is a great team that that we are that we are playing that we are playing great together so to be again here in the final it's uh, it's big thing for us and I hope we will put the crown on these three years you know uh, you know what it's hard to say we are we are playing so good especially in these games in these games you know first three quarters we are playing so good that we maybe became I don't know how to say that. We have too too confident, maybe. And when you are playing against great teams, you know you you should expect that they will do something. That they will not let you they will let you win by twenty twenty five points. So so you know they are all great players. Will Will Clyburn was making some amazing shots. So when you put all these things together, I think it's a. Uh, at the end, it's more it's more realistic that we beat them by three points or five points than than with you know fifteen 20, because it's not realistic. So, so yeah, I don't know. I just hope that it will not happen in the in the final. I mean, I'm sure that it will not happen in the final. If we will, if we will be half, that we will know how to finish the game. It's a great group of players, great with great coach. So for sure, it will not be easy. We are all aware of that. That, that they will play hard. We need to play hard. And I think it will be in the small details. You know, it's 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 fifty fifty game. For sure, they they will do everything to win. We will do everything to win. So it will be interesting. I I'm really excited that I will be part of that game, and uh, I hope that that we will win at the end. All right, guys, that's, you heard from both players right there. And, and you didn't hear me at the end. I actually asked those questions to those guys. And I, at the end of the Simone interview, I said, you, you talked about 50-50 balls. You talked about play-by-play, play, you know, uh, one play at a time. You talked about small details. This guy going to be a coach. He's going to come take your job in a couple of years, it sounds like, man. He's already got the coaching mentality. Or, or, or all, us bra- all us players are brainwashed by you guys. <laughs> I think both uh, both things are happening. You know, from one side, uh, he's very experienced. From the other side, uh, this is for sure what uh, his coach uh, asked from them. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, for the final game, two questions are uh, has to be answered. The first is uh, the participation of Kalathis. Uh, we don't know what exactly what ha- what will happen if he will be ready to play and how ready he will be if he will participate. From the other side, uh, I think that uh, from uh, for uh, FS uh, FS team, it's very important to produce on offense. And uh, the question, as Coach Adama said, uh, is about Larkin, how good he can uh, perform having a, not a good game uh, of uh, during the semifinals. For sure, Coach uh, Adama supported his player, and he he knows, and everybody knows. We all know that he's a great player, uh, and. Uh, these two parts for each team are very crucial for the for the final game. I think in general that uh, we will see a very interesting game with a lot of tactics from both coaches. From the other side, uh, I expect that uh, players that uh, they are very experienced and talented, they will step up uh, for their team 
and I hope that we will see a great final. Coach, taking my job from me, man. I love it. You make, you make it <laughs> I love when you make my job easier. Let's go off to David right now. Yeah, same thing. I'm pretty much going to ask you the same thing. Keys to the game, key players. What What are you looking forward to, to this final? Because it, what we have here is, is what everybody says that they want. They want the best offense against the best defense. And that's exactly what we have this year. So what do you expect? Yeah, I, I expect, uh, as Simone mentioned, um, about the intangibles. That's going to be critical for him because I think he's an unseen or unglorified stabilizer for FS. Uh, he has to play well uh, in order for FS to win. I like the fact that FS came out of this game without playing their best basketball, in my opinion. Um, you know, for me personally, defense is going to win the championship. Uh, anytime you have a high-powered offense, but now you take that offense and you insert the capability of being able to stop players, stop great players from scoring, that gives you a huge boost. Uh, relative to, to Barcelona, Galatis, a big question mark, big question mark uh, in terms of his health. But at the same time, they still have enough firepower um, to, to win. So if, if they can play great defense and stifle FS, um, I see them walking home with the, with the title. But the fact that FS did not play well, um, that, that leaves motivation for them on Sunday. And particularly Larkin, um, I would expect big things from him. So it's a great game. I wish fans could be in the building because it should be a lot of drama. You know, losing, losing the Final Four for them two years ago, it, it seems so long ago now. So there's not really a revenge factor. The fact that the last year of the season was unfortunately cut short and, and they were the best team in the league up until that point, it still doesn't seem like there's that there's that motivation or, the, or that you know I don't know if you know what I'm trying to say but but is is tomorrow's game their vindication is it their moment is there their moment to say we've been the best team for three years we have to put a stamp on this thing right now and if it is how are they going to do it I think for sure it's a vindication because they've been feeling this they've been talking about this and they were upset when the season got cut short especially Ottoman and. I think that tomorrow's game boils down to how much pressure Larkin will put on himself because if he keeps on gaining that pressure, then it might affect negatively to the other players. That's what I see from the team for, for the whole season. And I think that, you know, if they find the flow, if everybody touches the ball somehow, they're, they're going to find that rhythm and they're going to have the advantage. Um, one thing – for both teams, whoever controls the tempo and whoever is sustainable on defense, they're going to find a way to win the game. Because everybody, even with missing Kalates, maybe or not, um, everybody's capable of making plays. And we're going to see a fun battle. And I think that for me, I got I to gotta give props to my Turkish teammate from national team, Sartaj. He has been having an amazing year. And... He's actually putting a stamp on on Final Four as a Turkish player to show up there and putting the putting the effort. And I think that he has been the key for the team to stay together for the most the most part of the season. And it's great to see him success. I told him yesterday I want to be his agent so I can quit this job. <laughs> <laughs> they, hey, David and Sinan, you guys prepare yourself to make a prediction. I, I want a, a game prediction. I want an MVP prediction. I want to finish with Coach real quick, Coach. Strategy-wise, as a coach, you lose your best point guard. You lose Kalatas. Let's talk about Barcelona right now. Who, who are you going to? Who, I mean, who, who's who are they? Are they going to look for a different type of offense? Do you do you stick a in to, to lead the troops? What's your philosophy on that? Uh, first of all, I think that uh, uh, coach uh, Saras uh, is trusting a lot Bolmaro and Bolmaro. Although he is young, he got a lot of credit from him all season. And now, if Kalathis will not play, he, he needs to step up. He is a guy that showed uh, already that uh, he has big potential and uh, he can be an X-factor for this game. 
not uh, mainly scoring, but you know, playing uh, and organizing the team, bringing the ball with safety and uh, defending also on ball. Uh, I think he can be a good uh, solution if they have this problem with Kalathis. From the other side, for sure, the, he will find some uh, small forwards, I believe, to avoid also the pressure that uh, uh, FS uh, will, will bring uh, to bring the ball and to to find uh, pressure release uh, tricks to bring the ball and uh, start the plays on offense. Bal Balmaro played 27 minutes yesterday. During, during the season, we've seen Anga take over the point guard position at times. Exactly, more, exactly. More, they more have players that uh, they can bring the ball. Yes, small forwards that they can bring the ball and they can uh, organize the team. Coach, prediction, who wins, who's the MVP? Don't expect from me prediction. <laughs> <laughs> Look, when the, the biggest uh, reason not to predict the winner is uh, yes, yesterday's games because both of them in the last shot. Let's say you miss one shot, they score the other team from the other side, they win the game. If you score the first, they miss the second, the other team wins the game. So how we can, we can predict? Let, I would let, like to see, as I said, a good game that uh, will be fun to watch for all the basketball uh, uh, fans. And uh, I expect, as I said, uh, a lot of tactics, uh, the players with uh, experience and personality to step up and to watch a beautiful game. Hey, thanks to Coach. I'm going to ask David and Sanan the question in a different format. <laughs> Who, who's going to make the last shot of the game tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to predict, I don't want you to predict who's winning. I want you to tell me who's going to make the last shot of the game tomorrow. You know, the guy that makes the last shot doesn't necessarily mean they win. <laughs> they could be making that last shot down on 10. And <laughs> so I don't know if that, that's going to get your answer. But listen, at the end of the day, Joe, it's coming down to who plays defense most consistently and who has the fewest turnovers. You guys made my job easy for about 45 minutes, and now you're killing me because <laughs> as, as an ex-player, I, like, I don't like to make these damn predictions either. You know, you don't like to do that. But Sonata, I have to go to you now. You're the last one to talk, and the coach has got to go to practice. Um, I'll make, make sure that it's quick for the coach, and I have to – um, I have to root my root for my hometown team, Anadolu Efes. At this point, I can't make predictions because I, I want to watch a beautiful game, and I don't want to um, hold hold me. I I don't want my my prediction to hold me back. But I'm just expecting um, a fun game and hoping that Anadolu Efes brings the cup to Istanbul. Guys, this has been a, a different final for a different season. It's been special in its own right. And you guys, I want to appreciate you guys and thank you so much for being here, taking out the time to be on the crossover and make it even more special for me and for everybody else. You guys' opinions are like, you guys are like gods to me. So to be able to sit down and talk to you guys has been, has been a, a, an amazing experience. And I just hope that we get that last game just like yesterday, man, because this will be a great yeah. final four. And next year when we're doing this again, there'll be fans all over the place. Hey, Coach, maybe you'll even be here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. The pleasure was ours. Guys, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Joe. Good luck to everybody. Bye. See you guys. Good luck to you too, Coach. Good luck in the playoffs.